Thank you. So very good, Eduardito. <laughs> I love when he calls you that. <laughs> All right, so heat training, okay? So this, uh, some of you guys already asked me about this, Adriana, um, Dimato's um, runs, marathons, and stuff like that. Um, Eduardo works with uh, basketball athletes, so so then it's very useful information. And then usually I teach this in my courses, you know. So this is part of my book. So this is very good stuff, scientific. So I'm gonna give you like. Uh, a little bit of more scientific background about heat training. So when you talk about heat training, if you want to turn off the lights, would be a little better. Visualizing, perfect. So when you talk about heat, very important to know the fuel of physical activity. So if you remember, I already taught you guys this. When we start an activity, what type of energy source do we have? ATP. ATP. ATP will last for how long? Two to three seconds. Two to three seconds, very good. After that, what do we have? ATPCP. ATPCP, very good. So then, after we pass this, ATPCP will last for how long, approximately? 10, 10, 12 seconds. 10, 15 seconds, depends on the, the activity, depends on how intense you are doing it, correct? So now when you go here, now you can start seeing when you go, for example, a 1,500 meters race, what's the primary energy source that you can see here? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, very good. So carbohydrates becomes predominantly 94% and only 6% coming from ATP, CP. And then when you go like to a 10K race, what do you see here? 60% carbs, 35. 6% carbs and fat. 30, 35% of fat. And then when you go longer, so like marathon, and then you can see that carbs becomes even more important. So 65%, only 20% come from fat, and the rest come from maybe like a protein breakdown or stuff like that, but that's called catabolism. Remember, we don't want to do that. And then when you go to activities like lower intensity, but longer duration, the metabolism comes primarily from fat. fat. Very good. So if you, Remember this thing we had in upper level nutrition. I don't know if you remember, but the glycolysis, we have two types of glycolysis. Anaerobic and aerobic. Anaerobic and aerobic. What's the main difference between those glycolysis? Oxygen compound and the other one is about primarily from um, hydrogen ions like that. If you have oxygen, very good, so then is gonna be aerobic glycolysis, and you don't have oxygen, it's gonna be anaerobic glycolysis. So now to make it this better, my professor developed like a scheme so I can teach you and then show you these details. So for example, you need to understand that we have two big categories when we divide muscle fibers. We divide them in what type? Type one, type two. Type I one and type two, switch. very good. So the type one, they also call? Slow twitch. Slow twitch, but oxidated. That's why you yeah. see the O here. Mm -hmm. And the fast twitch, they are? Um, glycolytic, very good, so <laughs> glycolytic. So now you have slow twitch oxidative, fast twitch glycolytic. So now let's analyze the oxidative, for example. When you start an activity, this is, imagine like you have like, like, a, like, like, a, like a sink, okay? Mm -hmm. So you open, and then the water goes, right? So the water in this case will be the energy going here. So the first energy source that we have is? ATP. ATP. Then the ATP will last two, three seconds, like we said, then after that you're gonna have? CP. ATP, CP. So it's gonna last for another? 15 seconds. 10, 15 seconds, very good. So after that, in the oxidative, slow twitch muscle fibers, what's gonna happen here, according to the scheme? What's the next? other source that's available there that's kind of like fast glycogen glycogen very good so now we have a glycolysis going on exactly so if you have a glycolysis going on it's going to help to resynthesize this atp cp and then resynthesize atp and then produce energy again so now once we have 
the aerobic glycolysis, we have presence of oxygen or not? Yes. Yes, because that's why it's called aerobic. So usually in the slow twitch muscle fibers, we do have oxygen. So now look what happens. Once we do have oxygen, the pyruvate that gets produced in this process goes into the mitochondria. The mitochondria utilize the O2, you see here O2, oxygen, and helps to resynthesize the ATPCP and then ATP and so on and so on. Now when you start putting more intensity, when you talk about HIIT, what type of muscle fibers are we gonna recruit? All of it, all of it. We're gonna see, we're gonna recruit bills plus bills, these and bills. So because of the intensity, yeah, you can ask. Uh -huh. I was gonna say when you're doing the high intensity, you're doing this one. When you're taking the break, it's the other. The yeah, exactly. Very good. You're gonna get there. When you do high intensity, you're gonna recruit all the muscle fibers. When when you take the break, we're gonna use this part. Okay. So now this, there's a little bit difference between those. Try to see if you identify what's the main difference. The arrows. No mitochondria. <laughs> Um, the very little amount of mitochondria, exactly. So if you have a little amount of mitochondria, when you put intensity and you recruit those fibers to recruit, what's going to happen with them? Aren't they going to keep... They're not going to have a lot of oxygen and... Yes, yeah, so they're going to use primarily what type of glycolysis? Glycogen. Um, anaerobic. Anaerobic. Anaerobic glycolysis, that means the pyruvate is going to be, going to be converted to lactate, and with this hydrolysis, we're gonna have a high concentration of hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions can mess up with the actin and myosin sites, and then they, they mess up with the, the force production. Now, that's why you have a fatigue, and then you cannot keep up the intensity for long. Mm -hmm. So now, scenario here related to what you say. So let's say we, we did all out for 10 seconds. So both fibers stimulate, Glycolysis anaerobic, aerobic here, anaerobic here, and then now you produce lactic acid and hydrogen ions. What can you do to metabolize this? Um, to eliminate. To eliminate. Active recovery. Ions. Active recovery, exactly. I was gonna ask so you now about we that. go okay. look because they go to the blood, to the blood they go back to the fibers, and then also the fibers are interlinked in the same area so they go in the same area or in other areas and then get metabolized so you can see here the hydrogen ions and the lactic acid they can come here and then be converted again to pyruvate pyruvate to go inside of the mitochondria and then help this process so they also use for energy so wait if i want to write i'm trying to write that down because i feel like i'm going to be asked why i'm doing a recovery session in between the two sets. The okay, we're gonna get that in a minute. Okay. Save your question for a second. Let, let me get the whole the whole idea first. Now, these are the classifications. So remember, this is from physiology book. So pa pa pa. And then, very important, this when you're talking about different people. So if you get somebody from outside, you bring it in here. What's the concentration of fast twitch, twitch to slow twitch? In the normal part. 50, 50. About 50 50, exactly. When you get runners, elite runners. Long distance runners? Long distance runners. 80-20? 8 what? 80 what? 80% of uh, slow twitch. 80% slow twitch. Very good. So look over here. This is also from the physiology book. And then you can see that elite long distance running or cross country skiing, they can have up as 90% slow twitch muscle fibers. 90%. How do you know for sure the concentration? The muscle testing. What's biopsy. the name? Biopsy. The only way to know for sure that concentration is through biopsy. Do we need to do that for everybody? No. No. What's an indirect way to find out that? Assessments. Those tests that we use, very good. The VO2 test, and then more important, the one that we're gonna show in a little bit. So here you can see difference from from uh, different sports and then accordingly the more slow twitch muscle fibers you have and then you train what's going to happen to your view too this is your view it's going to increase going to be increased so, so so have a greater view two max in this way so now when you have a sprinter what's going to be this concentration to fast to slow 
60. It's going to be in the opposite or way, but 60. not as much. You can see here in the bottom, look, yeah. running 100, 200 meters. So the average in the 70%, and in some cases, eight, uh, close to 80% fast twitch muscle. So that means to make a real sprinter or a real champion in marathon, ultra marathons, it's hard. It's not simple because we need to have this, and then this is genetic related. Yep. Any other sport is a little bit easier to make champions because now they don't need to be like like swimming, you know, uh, weightlifting, wrestling, uh, basketball, we'll be in the middle. So they don't need to be as much as fast or as slow. Can I pee yeah. real quick, please? Please, please. Oh and then this all relates to this thing. So that's why when the force that we generate, this is levy, Kind of like light, moderate, maximum. Mm -hmm. So when you have maximum effort, what type of muscle fibers we recruit? Type two, feet. Yeah. Type two. Type one. Wait, wait. Could be here. If you have, so imagine from a hundred, you have somebody that has forty percent slow twitch, sixty percent fast twitch. If you have an intensity of only forty percent of the maximum, what is the fiber that is being recruited. Slow twitch. Slow yeah. twitch. When you have 60% intensity. Fast twitch? Mm. Oh. Intermediate plus slow. So see, so when you have maximum, you recruit all the muscle fibers. So the secret of, of training, especially training athletes, is to put high intensity. So now you recruit all the muscle fibers, not only half of them. So here, and then how we prove that. So this is testing that we do in the laboratory. And it's called um, aerobic and anaerobic threshold. So when you do here, you put somebody to cycle, similar to the YMCA that we did, but we, we check here, usually every two minutes, every two minutes we add an intensity. So now what's happening here, this is electromyography. So they put electrodes connected to the computer, and then they go either in the, in the bike, on the treadmill, and then they keep Analyzing and what's going on here, 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 here. What's going on? When the watts increase. This is the same as this, but this is just a skin. Over there is a real testing. So you can see here, here, and here. Can you see that? Yeah. So this is what type of muscle fibers being slow, slow twitch being used. And then when you get to this point, Fast. Fast. That's the intermediate that we call intermediate. That's kind of like your two A, and then here is going to be the fast. the fast twitch. So, so the higher the so now you have two thresholds: mm -hmm. aerobic threshold and aerobic threshold. So then you have those two thresholds: aerobic and anaerobic. And what's threshold. that on the left? hundred, two hundred. That's the the the. the Electromyography, the, 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 the impulse that the yeah, muscle right. generate, because remember, we, the central nervous system sends a signal, electrical signal, so the machine can read that signal and then see the muscle recruiting according to the signal that's yeah, been sent. But what's the value of 100 and 200? That's just, the, just for you to see close to the, 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 the intensity that the machine can read, just the, 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 the way the machine reads that. Okay. So important for us that we see the logic here. When you start adding intensity, what's happening? That because you see the potential power in watts, 50 watts, 150, 200, what's going on? The that harder increases. the Minus harder it gets, so more, fiber you're more fiber we're recruiting, exactly this. So see, when you have maximum. I'm gonna go pee real quick, because I don't wanna pee myself, I don't wanna miss this either. So the harder <laughs> you make, more fibers you need to recruit. But now, okay, so that genetic that we talk, average person, 50-50, if that person stopped training, would that change or not? Concentration. Yeah. Now no. the concentration is not gonna be changed because that's your genetic. Uh -huh. If you're born with 50% slow twitch, 50% fast twitch, that's never gonna change. Mm -hmm. But why, you probably notice if you had like a injury or if you had like a broken bone and then you stay out of training for a while, when you come back, you fatigue faster. Have you noticed that? Yeah. 
why but levels of uh, why mitochondria have decreased. Exactly. So what happened this? And so this will be an uh, research that is conducted in three groups. This will be active people, the bullet, the little bullets, sedentary people, and then people that be in the hospital. So when you test them exactly like this, put in a bicycle, for example, every two minutes you add 50 watts, see every, every station, and then what do you see in the active group? They take longer to get from... Take uh, longer, so you can see the base. same pattern here, aerobic threshold and aerobic threshold. This is because it's a lot of people that they test, so see, it's a lot of people, so all those dots. So, but you can see that the train keeps the same. So aerobic threshold and aerobic threshold, and then acidosis, and then they quit. But now what happens when you get sedentary? Spikes up real quick. Spikes up real quick, but their genetics the same. Mm -hmm. So what happened then? Why they, they lose? And then especially when they, get, when they get to the hospital, why this goes spike up right real quick? Because they're, like I said, the mitochondria levels uh, have decreased. Exactly. Or, or so the function, the function of the mitochondria gets diminished. So the whole point is this: we need to keep training. Mm -hmm. If we stop training, the mitochondria, especially the mitochondria, will lose their function. And then, you, as soon as we start exercising, you're gonna fatigue us quick. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna go into the anaerobic glycolysis. So that's that's important to to understand here. And how we test this? This is like. The, some pictures from Russia for the lab, where I went, and then we did this many times. What are we doing here? Hand ergometer. Hand, arm ergometer. Why we use that? Why we need to do that? To assess the VO2 max of why the not, body Why not uh, this? Because you're fighters instead of runners, I don't know. Exactly. So anybody, basketball players, anybody that needs to use upper body as well, you not only need so to sport measure specific. sports specific. So now you start to apply in view two because it's very important not only have a good view two when you test using your lower body primarily, but also in the upper body. So if I have anybody from basketball we train view to the lower body and upper body, and then look what's gonna happen. We're gonna have two graphs like that. One graph for lower body, one graph for upper body. Based on that, what do we do with the training? You compose it, you make it. We can I see mean, can where is the, the, the direction needs to be made in, because sometimes the guy has very good condition in the lower body, not in the upper body. As soon as he start playing, balls and shots and passes is gonna fatigue quick and the same as a fighter or, or a swimmer, anybody that needs to upper body. So now you can see how to do emphasis in your training, upper body, lower body. So you create emphasis. And then if your training process is doing accordingly to the plan, what should be next time you test this? Let's say you test today, after a month or six weeks, you test it again. What should happen with this curve? Should decrease. Should decrease, very good. Should go this way. That means you're getting more resistance to fatigue. So you're increasing your aerobic threshold and anaerobic threshold. What's another way, simple way, I already taught you guys that when you, how to identify the anaerobic threshold in any cardio equipment. What's a easy, simple way? It's R not as precise as this, but give you like the R idea. RPM? Kind of relates when you go to the uh, bicycle, for example. What? I put you in a bicycle, but we don't have the gas analysis oh. mask. Right. How do we identify, the Jessica? Is you remember? Is we we need the polar, like the yes. Max thing here? Not, not max, we need the heart polar. Heart rate. Heart rate. What are you going to do with the heart rate? That's, uh, well, uh, read it every minute. You're going to time every two minutes exactly like this. Yeah. So instead of having the electromyography here, mm -hmm gonna have the heart rate and then you're gonna make kind of like a graph yeah. and then you're gonna see that every two minutes you add more power and more power and more power and then the curve is gonna do what with the heart rate spike it. it's gonna start doing like a spike and another way to find out if you remember from this slide here that when you recruit the glycolytic muscle fibers they produce lactic acid and hydrogen ions remember mm -hmm. so that's gonna create another stimulus the ventilatory threshold so the guy is gonna start doing
kind of like you're gonna see that so you can visualize that plus the sweating on the forehead so that's another sign so you can identify those three signs and then you mark the heart rate that he got and then is approximately so that's kind of like not the most precise way but it's a functional way practical way mm -hmm. to test anybody just put it on the body and then, and then every two minutes and resistance okay so now look of course this will be very very uh, precise this is the treadmill that i showed this is a huge treadmill and then based on that we can formulate some ways to train the simple way what's the simple way to train cardio treadmill or just running just running people go sometimes go a little bit fast sometimes they go last and then yeah. just go like this so that would be a simple way so if you go up go down uh, that's not too precise and have the interval method what's the interval walk method run, walk Interval will be, for example, like let's say somebody more advanced. Could be walk, run, okay, but that's going to be very low. Let's say we're talking to somebody like mm -hmm. basketball ad, or somebody like in a higher level. So they run, let's say, five miles per hour for like two minutes, and then you put at eight miles per hour, they run for like a, a minute and a half. And then you go down, and then go up. And then Which is what I'm doing, basically. Yes. What is not the best method? What's the best method? All out uh, sprint. The sprint method. What's the sprint method? You sprint all out. All out. And then rest. And then active yeah. rest. And then go all out. And then I go again and again and again and again and again. Okay. And then why is this method so effective? I'll show you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So they did a bunch of research, and one of the research was this, and then they show if you run daily time, 30 minutes a day, 60 minutes, an hour and a half a day, all right? But now look at the percentage of the view, too. If you have A, they only run, A was 40% of you, 2 max. B is 50, here I don't know what they show, 70, 85, and 100%. If you have somebody that's already have a certain level, let's say um, high school athletes, um, amateur athletes, if you make them exercise at 40% of their viewer to max, what's going to happen with them? This is the muscular fiber mitochondrial content. So arbitrary units, the units that they use to measure, there's other ways to, to measure. They're using as many muscle fibers as they could. Wait, let's say, to make it simple, let's say you run, you're an athlete, and you have your VO2 max at 10 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. So when you run at 10 miles per hour is your max, you can go faster than that, to make it easy. So now 40% that will represent how fast? Four. Four miles per hour, so just to have an idea. So 40% of your two max, of course it's greater for those athletes, mm -hmm. but if you exercise at four miles per hour out of your 100, pretty much you're using what type of muscle fiber? Slow. Slow twitch. What happens? Even after one hour and a half of training a day, what happens to your mitochondria? There's no change. Uh, There's no change, doesn't improve more, why not? Because you're working at a really low intensity. Yeah, but I'm gonna show there's another reason why it, why it doesn't change, I'll show you in a minute. So when you happen, when you put an intensity as 50%, what happens? A little, a little bit, but when after, especially like after one hour, you see that? Take one hour for you to have the results. When you put at 70%, you already have a greater. When you have 85%, only take you 30 minutes. minutes. And then what about when you go all out? You die. 10, 20 minutes, you have the maximum amount of mitochondria. And the reason, I'll show you in one minute. This is the process of the, called mitochondrial biogenesis, the, the synthesis of that. And then the reason is because for every myofiber that you have, if you have a certain amount of level of training already, the mitochondria will be formed around that. And then as long as you don't stimulate more myofibers to growth, either through strength training, that's why strength training is also important, 
or spring training, you're not gonna create the new myofibros and then now the new mitochondria will not be formed. And then that was proved like years ago, so some Russian scientists, and then this will be the Z lines, you see? So the myofibro, and then those are the mitochondria, they're full. So that's what happened when you have somebody in the, in the, in the kind of like moderate to advanced level, they're slow twitch, they're already full. So the only way for you to produce more if you stimulate other fibers and then those fibers will grow in size and then now this is called theory of semorphosis and then new mitochondria will come there because they need that energy and then that's how you improve and then they were able not to explain all those details that's a let me see professor. if i understand so you get it but now you get it you increase in the mitochondria yeah the more mitochondria you have the better you are at, at like the more energy you have available the more able you can deliver that energy sustained for longer that means you produce okay. that aerobically because if, okay. if you produce energy aerobically that means you don't produce hydrogen ions the hydrogen ions that stop you from doing the activity uh, so the mitochondria is important to have a lot so now you can recruit a lot of muscle fibers without producing too much hydrogen ions that's going to stop you from doing the activity and the only way to do that is with high intensity. Okay. Or isotone, that's uh, what Jessica is doing for her capstone because then you can have more, especially in the slow twitch because it's already formed. So now you create more myofibers and then this new myofibers is gonna come new mitochondria. And then that we proved when we did isotone method with athletes and then what happened with them? The aerobic threshold got lower, so that means they got more powerful, less fatigue for the same intensity. Without doing any cardio, just doing the strength training in the isotone method. So it's another way to do it. And then we go, so it's more advanced. It's another class. Okay, so here, the deal. So how to do that? Another reason why that happens, when you exercise, this is in Russia, but they exercise at 60%, you can see 6% MPK and zero 2 max. If you exercise at 60%, in the slide shows here that they go about, this is about 30, 60, 90, 120, almost two hours to start going to the atkas will be the rejection, the time that they cannot go anymore. What happens to the adrenaline and noradrenaline at those, when they go to the rejection? When they, they keep going 60%, they cannot go anymore, past like two hours plus. What happens here? This is adrenaline, this is another, another adrenaline. What's, what's happening here with the release of hormones? What's going on? They're increasing. They're increasing, they're increasing to the max. And then the max happens when? When the lower rejection, when you reach rejection. When you reach rejection. So the whole point is exercise to? To failure. To failure, exactly. Now you stimulate the hypothalamus, you stimulate the hypothesis, then make those glands to produce the most amount of hormones. So the whole point is this, to create an anabolic training, you need to go to failure. But not long, because if you know you can have other problems with them, then we talk about that later. So they, my professor create the parameters for all those training. So these parameters, actually I can send to use later this slide. And then the parameters are, you need to have amino acids. So even if you train it just endurance, you need to have a certain amount of amino acids because now we're gonna produce those new myofibros to have those mitochondria, okay? So the, all that demands protein. So we're talking about 1.4 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram. Hormones, the hormones will come from not a steroids injected, but from the training. So it's called eustress. Eustress, the good stress is gonna stimulate the release of those hormones to the body. And then including testosterone, I had other slides that increase testosterone with the high intensity growth hormone and all this adrenaline, adrenaline. So all those hormones that all those changes in the body and then enough oxygen now it's a key here people don't know that so sometimes they want to make a hard heat training hard heat training is wrong because what do you think when they try to do a hard heat training what do they do to make it harder 
No rest. Huh? No rest, like little to no rest. Little rest, that's one mistake, and the other mistake, sometimes what they do. Instead of making you sprint for 10 seconds, they make you sprint for? Longer, longer than 30 seconds. 30 seconds, so that's wrong. You don't want to sprint maximally for more than 10, 15 seconds. Why not? ATP. Because after the ATP, you have ATP-CP. ATP after the ATP-CP, you have? Glycolysis. Glycolysis. Once it's almost so fibrous, especially the fast twitch, is going to be all type of glycolysis. Anaerobic because it's fast twitch muscle fiber. So it's going to be anaerobic glycolysis, produce a lot of hydrogen ions. It's harder to recover from that? It's not that it's hard to recover. Then you start to create an, a, a metabolic acidosis. And if you look at the physiology, that um, um, diminishes your performance. And not only that, high levels of hydrogen ions relates to the. Um, to destroying the structures of the mitochondria so you make a counterproductive training so that's not good so how we make it better then instead of putting more time so instead of doing the sprint for 30 seconds what do we do then? more sets uh, more, more sets exactly so the only way to do so look over here high level athletes especially russian are we doing 20 40 sprints so 40 interval that would be the max that we got so far so high high level athletes so of course that's too much. Uh, Jessica's been doing ten, and then <laughs> and then it's, it's a grass here, right? So ten is already good. Yeah, we started at three. We started at three, you know. So poor grass, and now she's doing ten. So when you get to this level here, you need to like very very high level. But it's good and to know that at three, like my heart rate at one point would go to one eighty three, and now at ten, my heart rate doesn't go above one forty six. I'm not too good here, but that's forty beats off. per minute, and I'm doing three and a half times as much. Process off of that page. So very important, stimulate maximally, don't let the fatigue those muscles, don't let the hydrogen ions to be there. So you do the for five, 10 seconds, and then break, make a break for a minute, active recovery. So even if produce a little bit from the resynthesis, and then you're still gonna metabolize in the slow twitch muscle arm. Then do it again, then do it again. Of course, takes time, like she said, like a year, but you build up your athletes, okay? And then there's other way, very important, especially like Imatsu was here, she runs marathons, so not only the fast reach, we want to make those mitochondria, but also we want to enlarge the heart to make more efficient. So the best way to enlarge the heart, we want to keep an intensity of 120 to 150 our, uh, BPMs, and then why? Because you can see here heart rate, and then goes here like 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, and then this is the stroke volume. And then this is also the percent of maximum of stroke volume. What do you see when you get in the 120, 130 range? Heart rate now. You put a polar, constant, run, 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 until you get a steady state. What happens here when you pass 120, you get in this 130 range? What happens with your stroke volume? Increases. Increases, Increases now get to the max. So that's the maximum. Look, after that, just stabilize. So if you go more, if you pass 150, it's not enough time for the oxygen to come back to the blood to pump. So then you not really get extra benefits in this case. So in this case, the maximum stroke volume that we have is in this 130, 120, 130 range, depends person to person. So that will be optimal to stimulate the size, so the grow and the size. So that will be, of course, not as important for a basketball player, but for a swimmer, long distance swimmer, long distance runner, uh, anybody that, the soccer players, you know, mm -hmm. that would be very, very important for them. And then this, you can keep like four hours to 10 hours. So that means you do like two hour session a day or something like that, keep that constant. So, but that, how you combine our hit with this? If you have somebody like a real like long distance uh, runner, marathon or swimmer, how you combine both now? The heat training plus this to train the heart. You put an interval, make a longer break. The hit recovery? And then you recover in 120, 130 range. So for example, if you use a treadmill, you put an all all, let's say you have a like a professional treadmill goes 15 miles per hour. You put 15 miles per hour, somebody like high level.
they sprint for 10 seconds, bah! and then you go back to close to their running speed, let's say seven, eight miles per hour, and then they go for two minutes, three minutes. And then you go again, and then you go again, and then you can do like two hours. So even you can do like one sprint every five to 10 minutes. So you fully recover, but you're still working on the heart. So now you work on the heart to make it bigger, more efficient, plus all the muscles to get. So is this where I'm putting the recovery in the middle of the sets? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. So this is more advanced than that. Okay, I'm just telling you yeah. the high, high level. And then uh, if you see here the number, so now you see the mode, so that's why you choose different activities because when you go in a, in a bicycle, for example, how many um, places of uh, touch that we have contact with the bike? So four, four, two. we have five because we have left hand, right hand, the butt in the, in the seat, oh, left foot and right, points of contact. So that means they, they evaluated that, and then in a cycle with those five points, for example, somebody that weighs 70 kilograms, about 150 pounds, mm -hmm. represents only 40 grams of force of impact. Now for a runner, the same 150 pound runner represents 200 kilograms, so 200 kilograms is like almost 400 pounds of force, boom, boom. So that means generating more stress, more impact, more injuries. And then this, not only that, in a, in a cycling, in a, in, a, in a race tournament, cycling tournament, they lose about three kilograms, so about five, five and a half pounds. The ratio temperature measuring in the butt, it's <laughs> about 40 degrees Celsius. So it's like really hot, it should be 37. So it's kind of like fever. And then in the marathon, they lose almost eight kilograms of dehydration and it goes to 42. That's like, that's why cases of death in marathon. So it's very demanding. And look, the cycling changed from 110 to 190 heart, heart rate. Uh, marathon, 165 to 180. Now look here, the muscle fiber. So this is a normal muscle fiber. This is the normal muscle fiber before a marathon. And then this is right after a marathon. What do you see here? A lot of damage. A lot of muscle damage. So that damage not only destroys the muscle, but also the mitochondria. The joints. The, the tendons and ligaments. So that's sometimes takes six months to recovery. The muscle recovery in quicker time, like two weeks to a month, depends on the damage from one race. Now that's why you see high, high level athletes they don't fully maximum effort, run more than two, three races a year, sometimes one race a year, especially when they get, because it takes a long time to recover. They prepare, yes, but not maximum. So now you see how you choose those modes. Now what about energy needs for that? So you need to know that carbs is very important to replenish all that, to recover, to make more efficient. So then you have stuff that's called Carb loading. Carb loading. What's carb loading? Getting a bunch of carbs so that the day of the race you have enough energy. Exactly. So now there is a way to do that more efficient. So this, the, 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 the demands for carbs for different athletes. So for example, very high intensity, very short. So here will be your basketball athlete will be, will be kind of like in the middle here. So this is uh, swimming sprints, uh, weight lifting, power lifting. So you need about five to seven grams per kilogram. Jesus Christ. Yeah. This is for carb loading. For yeah, to uh -huh. to make sure the carb the carb is enough for you to perform. This is daily yeah, for daily. You're gonna see carb loading is gonna be a little bit more, but I'll tell you how. If you high day short duration, 30 minutes, so like cycling, rowing, skiing, mountain, five to seven, so see about the same. So either you go a little bit less intensity longer or very high intensity short, about the same. Now when you go high intensity, short duration, 30 minutes, like fighting martial arts, or if you go moderate intensity long, you need more. So now you go from six to eight grams per kilogram. That would be marathon, uh, long distance swimming, okay. So 
Here are different sources. Also here you can calculate per day. So, and then per day, this, sorry. And then here per hour. So now during activity, how you make your body more efficient. So what do you do? Let's say you in a basketball match. What do you see in the little breaks? What do they do in the little breaks? Drink. They drink, pretty much what do they drink? Gatorades. They gel drink Gatorade. Packs. Gel packs more for like somebody on a bicycle or running because this actually helps. So this is the amount that you recover. So look over here. If you do an activity less than 45 minutes, do you need to replenish during? No. No, why not? Why not? It's too short. Because it's too short, it's not enough time if, for to do the... You can just eat before or after, right? Yes, if you know you, you don't need, because if especially if you have a normal level of carb, you don't fully deplete your carbs, so that's why you don't need. But now if you have a high intensity that lasts almost one hour, 45 to 60, so this will be kind of like your basketball, see here? Basketball or soccer, then you go from zero to 30 grams per hour, per hour. So that will be one bottle of Gatorade per athlete. And then, of course, if you go to marathon, you have more. Now look how to make the carb loading. This is good. First, cycle or running, any type of exercise continues that's going to use the glycogen. So you make a depletion day one. Then what do you eat for two days? Fat and protein. What about carbs? No. No carbs. Why not carbs? Is that like a keto day? Kind of, uh-huh. Because now you're going to do what after the fourth day? In the fourth day? Eat a lot of carbs. Uh, no, you're going to train again. Now what happens? You train, so in oh, this okay. case, you're going to have depletion of your glycogen. But now you didn't recover. Then you go again and then it still works to exhaustion. Like and then the so day. now you're really going to get depleted. And then what do you do in the day? Eat a lot of carbs. Eat a lot of carbs. Look. 8.2 grams per kilogram per day. So how much you have in kilograms? I don't know, like 80, I guess. What's your weight in pounds? 180. 180, divided by 2.2. .2. I'm 100 kilograms, so you can do mine. <laughs> no, you're not 100 kilograms. I'm like 90 I, I, something. How much you weight in pounds? 200, 211. 81. So you were 90, yes. So 81, 80, 81. So 81, 81 oh, times 80, 8.2. Eduardo, 81 times 8.2. 664 grams. So now you need 600 grams of carbs a day. That means if you do six meals, how many how many grams per meal? Wait, how much was it? I'm sorry. 111. About 100 grams of carbs per meal that wow. during those two days. Yeah, that's carb load. Diet. And then look, and then you go cycle again, and then have the following week. This was two weeks before competition. One week, second week. Well, I mean, I bet they feel like like really bad when they're eating that much, like that amount of carbs. But then the next day of the competition, they're like, yeah. Now look, look, now look what you do now. Okay, where are we now? We still have, we still have the following week. Now look at the following week. Now you do, for example, ninety meter run, day one. Then you go in a mixed diet, so not as much carbs, not too little. Balance. Balance. 40 minute, 40 minute. Then you go just a little bit of exercise just to maintain. And then what do you do here? Rest. High carb. High carb diet. Then rest and then boom, peak. Then and running for here. two days straight. Then you go here, your marathon. So you can apply the same principle for basketball, for soccer, for anybody that needs to come compete in that 30 minute one hour range this carb loading and then it's going to be very optimal and then here are those options how you get those carbs so bagel blah 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 white oh, there you go i can eat three bagels <laughs> on each meal, <laughs> on each meal. <laughs> so this is a tons of information here where you get those carbs and then two two things here important if you have a carb before or away from the training, what type of carb do we want to have? Good. Good. What is good carb? Uh, like sweet potato. Low glycemic. Low glycemic index, 
full of fiber, so it would be for example sweet potato would be good if it's yeah. away from the from the from the training or just to replenish your glycogen. When you're getting closer to the, the to the competition, moderate, let's say a banana, uh, soccer, soccer players they use the pasta like like one hour before the competition, like a huge amount of pasta just with tomato sauce. Atlas, my UFC Atlas, we made them eat like a large pasta just before we go to the arena. No fat and then very little protein either. Why not protein in this time? Too heavy. It's hard to digest. Do we need, we're not gonna need much right now in the competition, understand? Because what we have, the muscle that we have, we have, we're gonna need to form more. So even if you have less, protein is not gonna be a big deal. Most important here is the carbs. Very important, right before the competition. And uh, and then and there's an options, and then very important, why? Because look over here. The longer you go with intense activity, what happens to your glycogen levels? Depletes. Gets depleted in approximately one hour. So every time you have something intense, lasts more than one hour, then definitely you need it. And look what they did. They did groups of studies and we're using placebo and carbs. And then they group that supplemented with a little bit of carbs. What happens to those guys? Good dog. They went one hour longer, you see that? Oh, this okay. guy, in hours, one hour, you see in the first hour, it did not change much, but it's still. But especially when you have something ultra marathon, something very long, then the carb gets depleted, and then those guys will quit, and then these guys will still go on and on. So that's very yeah, important for man. long, for long. Yeah. And then other ways for you to enhance your performance, this is not only for running, for anybody that use like a um, high intensity interval training, is use? Bicarbonate trial? Carbonate, sodium bicarbonate. What is that? Oh. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then they use it and then it was able to, to, to perform longer. Why bicarbonate helps? Reduce, reduce the acidosis, the buffering. Uh. So as help as a buffering. So when you produce, remember when you go with a high intensity, mm -hmm. ATP, ATP, CP, glycolysis, if it's anaerobic glycolysis, we produce hydrogen ions and lactic acid. Bicarbonate help to eliminate that, don't produce as much. But how do they, do they drink it? And then you gotta ingest it, yes. Uh, yes. Water and baking soda? Yes, so but the only problem oh, is with well. baking soda with sodium bicarbonate, what do you need to be aware? So can make you oh, no, it's going to make you can make you have diarrhea so uh, then you need to start in the small doses to get tolerable to and then don't try before competition so try during practice so you can practice get used a little bit get used, used to it and then the same thing another thing that helps with the performance it's called beta alanine okay. beta alanine is another buffering Oh, that's Supplement. What it that's is why in for. another sports, yes, that's why in another sports. It so tastes horrible. Every pre workout, the no, bad alanine. The dose, I was done, I was done. Yeah, enough. Like the dose that effective dose for bad alanine is from three grams to six grams a day. And then, and then there's an article, look, the new article that I just read a couple of days ago. And then the effective dose from this three grams a day to six grams, depending on the weight. Mm -hmm. Uh, needs to be kept for 28 days then you have the maximum effect of that so keep using then you're going to start feeling the effect of the beta alanine supplementation and then just the last thing here almost done so look over here the mitochondria one more time if you get somebody untrained and then you train them for six weeks the proper ways to train what happens to their mitochondria level Increase. Increase almost double in the six weeks. After that, it's going to diminish. It's still going to increase, but lower after the six weeks. But if you stop only one week of fully inactivity, what happens to you? That increase. You lose almost half of the gains. See that? So that's why you don't want to be more than a week completely inactive. And then we'll take how long for you to get back to the level? 
two, two three, three weeks. weeks. One, two, three, almost four weeks to get back what you lost from one week of full inactivity. So that's very important for us and for our athletes. Don't let them go on vacation and just be completely lazy, you know? Make them exercise. So, for example, what do we do? What I used to do for those UFC athletes. Of course, they finish fighting. They don't want to fight. So make, okay, go play basketball. Go, go play, go do crossfit. Go do anything that stimulate, make those muscles contract, relax, and then will be enough to maintain. You're still going to have a little bit of a drop, but not, not as this. But yeah. if you go fully with no activity, then you have a big drop, right? So in summary, uh, carbs are very important, and then you can go from three to 12 grams of body weight daily. And carb loading is a technique that helps endurance athletes and any athlete that needs the performance for more than one hour. One hour. So anybody that's gonna perform for more than one hour or about that time, it's very important to have this carb loading. Mm -hmm. If you have somebody that's going for 30 minutes to one hour but with a high intensity, that's Olympic lift and basketball, what do we need to do? You don't need to do a carb loading, but what do we do? Keep eating throughout the thing. Yes, and then we add some carbs during the activity. And then to... to That's to, where my friends fuck up, because they, they compete. She's There's no one... I'm like, recording the things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Beep! Um, because they, usually they lift, and you know they, they lift once, and then depending on the way that they're going to lift, ne their, their lift, their, their next lift is going to be, they have to wait, so they have a break. And they usually, when they're done doing snatches, and then they have to do the clean and jerks, they eat Chipotle. Yeah, Chipotle and will not be the they, best option. Yeah, and then they bail out because they're cramping. Yeah, the Chipotle would not be the best option, why not? You just A lot of sodium? 